Okay guys, so this is part two to the uh, Todd Driscoll, who's the regional, uh, uh, I'm gonna get this wrong. He's a wildlife field biologist for Texas Park and Wildlife. He's based in Brooklyn, Texas. He oversees a lot of East Texas Lake, mainly for us, including Toledo Bend and Sam Rayburn. So they're tracking fish on Toledo Bend. This is part two. I've either got six or seven parts to this video, and uh, he's gonna tell us what exactly they're doing, why they're doing it, and what they're discovering by putting radio transmitters in. I believe they're tracking 26 fish right now. So this is part two. In the next couple of days, I'll get up the part one of the Vexus boat review. So we're out in a Vexus this week. Stick around, we'll get that up for you as well. Check it out, guys. Okay, anything else you wanna talk about on why you did this? Yeah, uh, some of the things that make uh, our study unique in addition to the, the, the boat motor noise, the effects of fishing on the fish behavior, uh, the other thing that, that we were trying to do anyway, it's, it's, it's proven to be a little bit difficult because a little bit higher tagging mortality, and that is our original 26 fish that we tagged at Toledo, 13 we caught shallow in the shocking boat, but 13 fish we caught in 12 to 35 feet of water fishing. Why did we do that? We want to potentially dive into the potential behavior, behavioral differences of shallow fish versus deep fish. That's always been a topic of angler conversation. Man, some fish, they just want to stay shallow. Likewise, those deep fish, maybe besides the spawn, they don't ever come back to the bank. If we can keep our sample size up high enough, we're going to dig into the, into the differences there. Yeah, that's a great question. I've always wondered... And, and somebody told me once, and I can't remember who it was, maybe in you, a fish can only vary so much in depth for any prolonged period of time in a day, correct? No, I mean, they're, they're pretty flexible for short periods of time. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah, they could feed 15 feet shallower, but they can't move. Am I saying that right? Could the no, fish... they're, they're pretty adaptable okay. you know, for short periods of time. That's why, you know, if you think about this, you catch a fish out of 30 feet of water and release it within a minute or two, they're fine, right? That's what I'm getting at. I mean, they can pretty much, if, if they can move in very depths, they're, they're pretty flexible on the depths they can give in, that they can get into uh, at any point in time. If a fish is resting in 35 feet of water and moves to 10 feet of water to feed, does he have to go back to 35 feet pretty quickly? I would speculate and, and say yes. Yeah, just due to the, it, the pressure differences. All right, so tell me what, what are you seeing are there truly deep fish and truly shallow fish? We can, we've, I've got some numbers here. But we'll get into that in okay. just a little bit. See, I keep trying to get him to go to the numbers. Well, I, you know, I think it's important to point out, I mean, bass telemetry studies have been pretty common over the last 20 years. Okay. I think it's pretty important to point out some of the unique things that we're doing that really very few, if any, people have looked at. So we got the, uh, we got the shallow versus deep fish deal that we're going to try to dig into. Now, I mentioned the mortality. I can jump into those numbers too a little bit later. We're seeing a little bit higher mortality. It makes common sense, right? When we're catching those fish, getting to your question about barotrauma and the need for fizzing in the air bladder and all that, when we catch those fish, because we're holding them for so long to do the surgery, I have to fizz all those fish. So you got the stress of hooking, capturing, there's five or 10, 15 minutes of live roll retention. Then we hold them to do surgeries and we hold them for 15 or 20 minutes more to make sure they're 100% healthy right after the surgery, so there's a lot more handling. So we're seeing about double the mortality of those deep caught fish just because of the additional stress factors. It just mm -hmm. makes it just sure. makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So we, we may have to continue to catch more of those fish, kind of keep them rolled in to keep that sample size of deep fish high. So we've got that going on, and then uh, the other uh, neat thing is there's been very few studies done on very large reservoirs. Why? Because they're just harder to do when fish theoretically can get away. But that's really the high need to do it on a lake like Toledo. It gets back to what we're talking about with this fishing pressure. Behaviorally, have these fish learned to avoid anglers in the noise we make in the boats? At Toledo Bend, fish could literally move out to that main basin three or four miles out from housing and never be messed with. All right, so for our non-Texas viewers, or for the guys who haven't been on Toledo, all the fish are in Housing Basin. Yes, yes. And Housing's, what would you say? It's 5,000 acres. Eight miles deep? It's, yeah, six to seven. Okay. Yeah. And probably at its widest point, two miles across, yeah, maybe not quite that wide. Yeah. So it's, it's the size of a lot of small lakes. 
Yeah, we picked housing because it, it represents Toledo Bend as a whole with all the various uh, habitat types. It's pretty diverse in that regard. Plus, it's one of the most popular embayments on the whole lake for fish. Absolutely. For sure. Fin and feather's been there for years. So you do a study on a, on a 186,000 acre reservoir, you have to have a an initial study area. Sure. I mean, we can't tag fish all over the place and have any time to go track them. Right. So at housing is our study area, and, and we're trying to document whether those fish uh, stay in housing or potentially leave. I'm trying to think where you caught 35 feet deep fish in housing. There's not a whole lot of places, but yeah. That's... Out of the outer half on the yeah. lip of the bayou. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's 40, 45 feet out there in front of fin and feather. Yeah. But, you know, on a smaller lake, a 2,000 acre reservoir, let's just say Lake Nacogdoches, in theory, those fish really can't even get away from anglers, in theory. Yeah, they can move out to the middle of the lake, but are they really getting away from fishing pressure? Maybe a little bit, but not so much. A lake like Toledo Bend, with all the timber, you know, if you envision a fish swimming four or five miles out in the middle of that timber and suspending in 20 feet all summer, Hard it's away from everybody. So, on large you lakes, you know what that makes me think of the kid that, and I say kid, college kid that won over there this past spring, out in right. front of. Indian mounds yes. with a live scope, flip into open water fish, chasing shad with, with a spoon. Perfect example of what I'm talking about. Fish that nobody ever fished for, and he just ran away with two turns in a and, row. And if I, if I recall correctly, I mean, he was at least in, in fairly close proximity to traditional depth type areas that you and I would go idling around in. The fish were maybe just up off the bottom. That's but right. you expand that to another level to where, what if... 20% of the fish in housing swam four or five miles out in the basin. Over and they're not feet. molested. They wouldn't be out there. Yeah. And I both know that. Yeah. So that's what we're exploring. I mean, common sense tells you they probably won't, but who knows until you look at it. Because if that you can't happens, catch them, you'd never know. And that dynamic can only happen on a large, vast reservoir. Yeah. So that, that's really the, the other really unique thing uh, that, that we're doing. There's only been maybe two or three other published studies on lakes 25,000 plus acres. And pretty much the same thing going on at Fork? Same exact thing, yes. Same, so exa same exact study protocol. They picked an area of Fork then? Yes. Okay. I don't recall the exact area. Uh, you could get with Jake and he could give you those details. Uh, the only thing that I think differed, uh, Jake has not tagged any deep fish specifically. Okay. All his fish were electrofished fish. But other than that, same study protocol, you know, outboard, motor noise, fishing, all that. Were some of these fish angler caught fish, or did y'all catch them all? I had a uh, good friend of mine, a retired buddy, uh, George Herr, over there that, that helped us out a lot. Otherwise, it was all us. But he was kind enough to, to scout a little bit for us and kind of have a few fish pinned down out deep. And, and heck, I think he, he provided probably 70% of the deep caught fish himself. Okay. We wouldn't get over there until 9 o'clock in the morning, and he'd get over there at daylight already have two or three fish in the box for us typically. Interesting. So yeah. yeah and fun. you, and I, and I know we've, you, I, you've probably got more stuff you want to talk about, but you released the fish largely where you caught them? Yes, we pretty much released them exactly where we caught okay. them because that could obviously bias movement yep. patterns, yep. right? You wouldn't want to displace a fish. These fish were the exact location of capture was recorded. I mean, they were literally within 10 feet of where they were captured, where they were released every okay. single what, anything else different about what you're doing now versus what no, else has been done? No, that pretty much sums it up, you know, the objectives and kind of the unique aspects of it. Okay. Keep trying to check our time. Okay, we're eight minutes in, so we can go a little longer on this one. All right. Now I can kind of jump into the numbers. You know, looking at some of this we've already talked about a little bit. <laughs> uh, first, the, the fish tagging and some of the mortality, really kind of the normal or expected mortality we've seen. You know, we... we in May, we kicked it off. We, we tagged 11 shallow fish, and then in June and July, we got a couple more shallow fish, and then the, the 13 deep fish we, we did in June and July. And again, those were out of 15 to 30 feet or so. So we had 26 total tagged fish, half shallow and half deep. Only two of the shallow fish uh, died due to uh, surgery related things. And I say that, you know, if it, it's pretty much common sense, you know, two to three weeks post-surgery, if the fish dies, it's likely due to the surgery. If it lives longer than three weeks, well then probably not. So two of those shallow fish uh, died due to surgery, but three of the deep fish did. Uh, but then after that, we had three additional uh, deep fish die six plus weeks post-surgery, which eliminates the, uh, the surgery. 
two of those three were caught by anglers. And you know, how do you know that? I forgot, I failed to mention that when we tag these fish, we also put a pink Floyd tag. Uh, Off the, that's the little dorsal fin tag? Yes. Okay. That has my personal cell phone number. Okay. Of course, it, you know, it's TPWD study fish. What, I don't remember exactly what it says, but it's please call this number to report a catch. So we certainly hope everyone calls. I, we have evidence that you know, I don't think everyone has. Uh, those two deep fish that I mentioned that, that died, that they, the anglers did call them in. But they, so, they, they harvested those fish? No, they released the fish. Okay. But they, but now, they whether, whether that capture event had anything to do with their death or not, who knows? It could be an added stressor for sure. I'm sure you're going to get there, but I'm assuming fish have been caught and released and survived yes. as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We've had five total fish caught by anglers, and I guess only two of those five have died. Okay. Were the other three that survived shallow or deep fish? I, I'd have to look here. Remind me if I don't answer it later. I don't exactly recall. Okay. I think maybe one was deep and the other were shallow, but... Uh, you know, I'm not implying that, that, that the angler catch events what killed the fish, no, but, but, but it yeah, sure could be a factor, sure, yeah. especially you know with deep fish and, and uh, the fact it was tagged, it might have been held out of the water longer than usual. Hey, hey, what's this? Let's get a picture. You, you know, you can kind of play the scenario out in your head, and, and by the time they released it, maybe it might have needed fizzing and wasn't. So things like that could have happened. But uh, anyway, we had three additional deep fish die that weren't due to surgery. Could have been just plain old natural mortality. So back to what I mentioned before, it's, it seems like it is going to be a little bit harder to keep our sample size up those deep fish. That, so that's so contrary to what I would think. I would think those deep fish would be more hardy because they're going back to a more stable environment at depth. Well, but it, it's the, the, the capture stressors, you know, fishing for them, the, the capture event, being in the live well, even though, I mean, conditions are as perfect as they can be in our boats. The fact I have to fizz the fish, because undoubtedly we have to hold them long enough, you're going to have to fizz it. The surgery and then the release, I think just, you just have enough confounding stressors in there that just add up to equate to a little bit mortality. Now, with all that said, we still have, what, seven deep fish that are perfectly fine and have been for a couple of months okay. post-surgery. But we're just experiencing a little bit higher mortality of those deep fish, which makes perfect sense to me. Okay. So we've got... Uh, 18 total fish, still in theory, potentially viable out there. But of those 18, uh, we're only finding 13 or 14 of those fish pretty much every time or 80% of the time, which means that three or four of those fish were, were just uncertain. We're not getting any uh, beep. We're not finding, I mean, if the fish dies, like we talked about earlier, we get the mortality beep. We're not getting that, which means that one of two things, either the fish has moved outside of housing on its own, or the, well, there's actually three things. Either the fish moved outside of housing, it was caught by an angler and maybe transported out of housing, or just the transmitter failed. One of those three. And you know, we may never know. Yeah. Until you get a, a hit on a fish or a mortality hit, you just don't know. How long will the transmitter produce sound after the death? It really eats up the battery life. I mean, we've got uh, a projected two-year lifespan of these transmitters. The study's going to last at least two years, and we still have transmitters held back for later tagging this next spring and summer to keep num uh, telemetered fish numbers up. Excellent. But two years of, of life, but when they beep mortality, they beep 24-7 at double the rate. So the battery consumption is like fourfold yeah. because to get two years of life out of these uh, transmitters, we have them dialed into where they only are activated from like 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Then they shut off at night to save battery. Wow. So when they're beeping mortality, they just don't last very long. Right. right. So uh, and we've still got decent numbers of fish out there for sure. Now, one of those fish, one of those three or four, was a uh, fish that was caught by a tournament angler and transported to Six Mile County Ramp and weighed in. So we know what happened to that fish. And we need to go back over there in Six Mile at some point to see if it's still alive over there. And it was going to be, and it's going to be really interesting to see if that fish makes it back to house. Yep. Because based on what we For know. For the guys who don't know, about how far would that be? Previous studies have shown that the maximum distance fish have been shown to, to 
to relocate back, you know, the homing mechanism, if you will, is 11 or 12 miles. And that's about just guessing without doing a calculation. I mean, that's what about that range. That's what so, I would guess, back out and around and back in there would be. So in theory, I mean, it could be possible that fish makes it back in the house. We haven't documented it yet. But we need to jump back in the house in here pretty quick and just see if we can find that fish. How often are you going over there? Every two weeks we're doing these tracking events. Okay. Right. Yes, every two weeks. All right, so that, let's, uh, that's part two. Let's pause there and then let's come back with part three and talk a little bit more about what all of us are dying to know, what the behavior you're seeing out of these fish. Yeah. And uh, where the eight pounder is, well, I need a waypoint on that if you were. <laughs> okay, so that's part two. Uh, part three will be up in the next few days. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we've also got the Vexus boat review up this week and a bunch of other boat reviews. I think the next boat, I'm kind of lining them up as I go. It's either going to be a Blazer 650 or it's going to be a Skeeter FXR or FRX. I get them confused. But one of those two boats will be up here in the next few days as well. So stick with me. Uh, we're working our way through our boats, guys.